Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. I have with me today a good friend, a special guest. His last name is Chapel, and he's from Lancaster, California. Spent his whole life at Lancaster Baptist Church and West Coast Baptist College. Again, welcome Mr. Chapel to the show. <laughs> hey, what's up? <clears throat> You're not related to Paul Chapel. No. Okay. No. So we've got the first YouTube comment out of the way. Yeah, we have to throw that out there. Um, it was the most commonly asked question growing up, though. So it's obviously completely understandable why. Although a lot of times it just seemed like people just weren't doing their homework because um, I, I went on tour. At the college? Well, people at, didn't do their homework at the college? Well, that's that's also true. Oh. Um, but no, when, when, when I was on tour for West Coast, uh, we would go out you know, sing on stage, whatever. And I would introduce myself and people inevitably would come us, come up to us after the service and be like, royalty. Yeah. Like, are you, you know, related? And just like, did, have you ever seen a picture of his family? Like ever? <laughs> like I look nothing like any of them. You're like a deep cut, like a cousin. Yeah. So it, it always started with like, so, uh, so, you know, David cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They always, you know, uh, calling IFB people too liberal you know, that yeah. guy, um, he cited me in an article one time, uh, with a friend of mine, Mark Rasmussen and referred to us as the kids of Dr. Mark Rasmussen and Dr. Paul Chapel. Mm -hmm. And Mark was Mark's son, but I was not. So the next revision of the article came out and said, pastor Paul Chip, uh, Chapel's nephew. And then the next revision came out no. and, and said something about a different relative and then finally the fourth one, he just like dropped me out completely because it wasn't as interesting, I guess, when they right. found out that I was just a son of a realtor. <laughs> right, so. right. Well, you're not a very interesting person. So that's a good, so good that's to a get wrap. that out of the way as well. <laughs> no. So take me back. I mean, <clears throat> you are a lifer. I mean, you went, you grew up at Lancaster, went to the elementary school, high school, college, all the above. <clears throat> so what, yeah. what, how do you define like your early experiences there? Yeah, so I, and whenever anybody asks me this question now, I basically kind of refer to it as this big bubble, um, because that's really essentially what it was. I we grew up on the east side of town, and in East Lancaster, that far east, it's nothing but just dirt and tumbleweeds and Joshua trees, and we lived a mile further east of the campus. <clears throat> and so, when I say bubble. I, I really mean that in almost every practical aspect of the word. Mm -hmm. The only thing that wasn't there was like my extended family, right? So it was just my immediate family that went there. So my extended family was not a part of the church, but everything else was, you know what I mean? Like I, I went to Sunday school when I was three and a lot of the friends that I knew from three-year-old and four-year-old Sunday school class, all of us are enrolled in kindergarten together now. Was that your first time ever in church? Like, are you like a first generation uh, yeah. So my parents were, uh, I think Christian, they like both grew up Christian, but very much like culturally you know, Christian. generic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Christianity. Um, I think they went, I think if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, mom and dad, <laughs> but I think they went to the vineyard for a little bit before they started going to Lancaster. Um, uh, when I was like a really little kid. Okay. Um, and I may have been like baptized or something. I don't know. We, they were, they were Christian, but they yeah. wanted us to have more of a, a strong uh, mm -hmm. Christian upbringing than, than, than theirs was. Yeah. Um, which is why um, they, they got invited to the church. They started going to the church and then they enrolled us in, in kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of talked about it, um, you know, going kindergarten and then a lot of people you grew up with your whole life. So you had, it's again, the pros and cons of a bubble. Like you've got oh, that family feeling there. Yeah, definitely pros and cons with that because some of my best friends are literally, I, I don't even really like refer to them as my best friends. They are literally my brothers at this point. Like we grew up together, you know, oh, that's like, there's cool so too, many, there's so many. We're like a family. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. But, but legitimately it's yeah, just, yeah. You, you can't replace that type of friendship. Sure. You know? Like when you've known somebody from literally the time that you can remember, you know, it, it's a, it's definitely a deep friendship. And some of them I went all the way through college with, you know, like mm -hmm. some people left along the way or left and came back or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, my two or three, you know, best friends in the world I've known since I, since we were three, right. you know, and, and all of this was pretty positive, right? I mean, like you, you don't, yeah. 
you don't look back at your time and go like, man, that was a horrible traumatic experience. No, no. As a whole, I don't. Um, and I, I think that my, my perspective could be somewhat skewed because I was like, I was a good kid in, in, in quotes. I was a good sure. kid. Like I, I, I did the things I was supposed to do. And so it, for me, it was all the normal issues of growing up like that. The mm. just, just, you know, tons of guilt that are mm. offloaded onto you for thinking anything or doing anything that's outside of what God or the church wants you to do or whatever. Mm. But there wasn't, um, like I don't have any, like, you know, the way that I would define it as a deeply scarring thing that happened yeah. or deeply traumatic things that happened. It was just, like I said, pros and cons. I, yeah. I, I, I would not recommend how I grew up to other people sure. and I would not raise my kids the way that I was raised. Um, but I, I also, I, I, there's some, a lot of things that I'm thankful for and there's a lot of things that I would also change and, yeah. and, and, and that I'm very conscious of now as a parent. So obviously it's very formative. Like it wasn't, you said it wasn't like, a brutal experience where it's yeah. like, Oh, you look back and like you have PTSD from like this childhood experience, <clears throat> but obviously there's things that are different, you know, like looking back, back in retrospect, it's like, yeah, I would have changed this or I wish they wouldn't have done this. Or maybe I have guilt. To, so, you know, all, a lot of people that grow up in religious circles talk about that. Like there's a joke about Catholic guilt, you know, you yeah. do that with Baptists as well. Like looking back, what are some of the things you look at now and go like, eh, that wasn't healthy, <laughs> you know, like that yeah. wasn't a healthy way to form my worldview. Yeah. Well, that's for sure. One of them guilt it, uh, still to this day, I, I struggle with some with, with guilt from, from things that I have a completely logical explanation as to why I think that it's totally fine yeah. and actually should be encouraged. And I'll still have this just psychological embedding of guilt that, that, right. that comes with it. Um, but some of the other things are more tied to my inner worth and self-worth, self-confidence in some of those things, because you're, you're taught so much that you're just a worthless piece of garbage and that there's nothing intrinsically good about you. And that the only thing that's good about you is this being that exists beyond the natural world that also exists inside of you. And that's the only thing that redeems how horrible you are. And so a lot of those <clears throat> and that affected you as a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, it's interesting because I think as an adult, when you come into that, a, a lot of your prefront, prefrontal cortex is already formed. And a lot of the way that you view the world is formed. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to at least think critically to a certain extent and can, in, in your brain can subconsciously or consciously stop certain thoughts from, you know, uh, forming inside of your mind. But when you're a kid like that, it's just, it's a blank canvas and mm -hmm. they can paint whatever they want on it. And, and I think a lot of those things are really, really damaging beliefs to put into a, in, into a kid's mind. And, and I, I struggled a lot with confidence, um, in a lot of those areas. And you probably wouldn't have thought that if you knew me growing up, but I had a lot of just deeply seated doubts about mm -hmm. my ability to do anything beyond like having God allow me to do something, you right. know, like, like even silly things like. Uh, you know, I played a lot of basketball growing up. And so if I didn't feel like I was right with God before a game, I would like literally go confess to my parents any sins that I had committed so that God didn't punish my team and make us lose because I wasn't right with him before I started right. playing. Because clearly my entire ability to play basketball comes directly from God. It wasn't the hours and hours and hours I spent practicing in my driveway and everybody else was inside playing video games. Yeah. That wasn't it. It was just like, it comes from God and God can decide to take it away just like that. You know what I mean? And, and it's always this thing in the back of my mind that like, I'm never good enough. I'm not good enough to do anything. I always need help. And, uh, and I have to directly ask for it or else I'm not going to do well. Yeah. Well, what's crazy with that is like, even confessing all that, you're probably a lot like me and like, there wasn't that much extreme stuff to talk about. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, there's this high level of shame associate with like not doing really bad stuff. Like I right. look back and go like, I was a good kid. Right. You know, like For I, all intents and purposes, it wasn't lighting, you know, <laughs> convenience stores on fire and right. stealing stuff. I and, hear people's like, stories and they're like drugs and sneaking out, like sneaking out. Like I can't ever imagine sneaking out of my house. Yeah. Like I can't, you know what I mean? Like the worst thing ever would be like porn. You know what I mean? Like yeah. in like, yeah, now my, in my, retrospect, my worst like, thing was, uh, was sneaking around with, uh, with Jackie, who's my now wife. Do, they, but, do your parents know that or is this? Yeah, you? no, okay. like legit one time we actually, uh, I, 
I felt so guilty following some Sunday morning service one time that I actually made Jackie come over to my house uh. and we sat down together and t confessed to my parents that we had been sneaking around and like doing stuff. And and we, we were still, you know, still had our V cards and we got married and everything, but we were doing, uh, you know, a lot of other stuff. And, uh, and we literally, like, I felt so horrible about it that I had to tell <laughs> my parents and I, and I've like, I felt like Jackie, should it, it was just this totally weird, awkward <laughs> yeah, yeah. situation to put yourself in as a 16, 17 year old kid yeah. to invite your girlfriend to your house and tell your parents that you're sneaking around. Like it was just, it's such a bizarre uh, situation because so, we were not doing anything that 16 year old kids, you know, shouldn't be doing or whatever. So you want to make your free throws. So you have to make her confess. Exactly. So you're good to go. Exactly. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, like I said, like, like, looking back, there's not a lot there. So I don't want to like dig in to like Lancaster a ton because I think again, your experience has been pretty positive. There's a lot of people who've had blatantly negative experiences. Well, And I think that but, I, like, there's a lot of negativity to come out of the place. Yeah. I'm not denying that. And, and, and I know a lot of people who struggled tremendously yeah. for real reasons that were directly yeah. from administrative authority. Right. They came out of that did, place. Did uh, you have anything like that for you where you go like, Oh, that specifically really, um, hurt, you know, or is it, you know, it, it wasn't, it was never, it, none of that really happened to me until I was getting ready to leave. That's what I thought. It, yeah. it was all very much on the tail end of my experience there. It was all like, be, because I never viewed it from a different perspective growing up. It was to me in my mind, it was always like, everybody just wants what's best for me. So even if it hurts me now, it's probably what's better for yeah. me in the future. And I, that was it's something like I always camp. understood. It's yeah. like they're training me for something. And, I, and I've kind of always been though. I don't know why I just always look long term. You know, yeah. and, and I give and I and I'm somebody that gives everything that I have to whatever I'm doing. And so at the time, whatever what I was doing was trying to please God. So I gave everything that I had to that. So I got made fun of by other kids who like, you know, were the cool kids or whatever that didn't take it seriously until right. I became the position of authority in, in the school, in the hierarchy or whatever. And so I was able to kind of set it and be like, hey, we're spiritual here or whatever. But before it was like, you know, kids making fun of me for stuff like that because I was always the one just like I said, to give everything that I have. And you know me for a while now, like you understand that that's just my personality. I've, I've never right. met you before. <laughs> like whatever I do, I do it fully. I was going to ask and, if you're high performing because you like have a very alpha mode, you know, not cliche, but like what you would consider like that alpha <clears throat> sales, you know, high performer personality. Like, yeah. and it feels like that's a direct relation to that you know yeah that's that's what's interesting is i, I talked to obviously a ton of people now with all the podcast interviews that i've done over the years and a lot of people ask me about you know well is that time that you experienced growing up is that why you can do all these other things and it's like yes but also nobody else i grew up with does any of the stuff that i do so it's not like it was a breeding ground or training for ground like for high that. achiever you know what i'm <laughs> yeah. saying like well, I, like so i don't really i don't really know exactly how to answer that all i know is that like i always had that bug in me yeah. i always wanted to, to compete so like fine arts growing up like i was it, it captain a bible quiz team also i was preaching the preaching contest yeah, also yeah. i had a duet acting speech preaching also contest. i had a humorous interpretation yeah. speech also i was in choir and large and small ensemble like i did i, I played chess like i just did as much as i could i gave my all to my academics you know i my last quarter of of school i got like a 4.12 that quarter like i just i was always just whatever i was doing whether it's basketball sports academics bible singing guitar i just wanted to do it as as best as i possibly could and so i think that i think that that kind of um uh, uh stuck with me gave me opportunities into college and stuff but i didn't experience anything negative around that until i decided that I don't know if I want to take all of this stuff that I've done and go use it in ministry. And that's when it started to kind of like rain down on me that it was like, Oh, this is not as welcoming as an atmosphere as I've been trained to believe my whole life. Right. Well, I mean, that raises two questions and this is probably, I think for both of us, like we're very different people. Like I think people even watching this see that like there's two very different personality types here, but I think for both of us, probably the most traumatizing experience we've had with the church has been, saying we don't want to do the status quo thing yeah. that the church does. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think neither of us, and I might be reading into this, but I think from our conversation, this is probably true. I don't think either of us had this ill will to like, forget you guys. I'm going to go do my own thing. Like, yeah. I think probably both of us would probably still be there 
if the response had been, you go get them, you right, know, like, right. um, so what, what made you go? Like you're a high performer, you're doing really well, you're getting good grades. You're like crushing it in all these areas. What made you unsatisfied with where you were at? It was the first steps that I ever took outside of the bubble. Mm. It was the first steps I took into the real world. So when I was a junior, um, I was interning at a church every weekend and, and the church was great. And I'm not saying anything negative about the church or my experience there, but it did teach me that like, oh, this is what it's going to be like for the rest of my life. You yeah. Know, like, you get that window toward like the yeah, future. Right. But during the week I was back at school and I was, I, for, for the first time I got a job doing door to door sales and it was my first time ever experiencing anything in sales. And frankly, I was pretty good at it. And I enjoyed it and I enjoyed seeing the fruits of my labor on a paycheck that was bigger than all of my, you know, coworkers that were working there because I worked harder and I outperformed them. Therefore my check was bigger and I liked that. And then on the weekends, you know, when I could, which is prime door knocking time, by the way, like Saturday, Sundays, prime door knocking time. I wasn't there. I was out, volu you know, volunteering. Mm -hmm. Well, they actually paid me, I think, you know, some meager hourly wage or whatever, but I, I was, I was there at the church doing church stuff. And I found myself the entire year when I was down there serving on the weekends, I was just like, man, I, I can't wait to get back to school. Right. Calculating. So, yeah. So that losses, I can, yeah. So, that, yeah, so that I can, you know, get back into selling and, and, and stuff like that. And I had the opportunity to build my own team out and all this stuff was coming uh, down the pike. And, um, frankly, I just started to realize that like, man, I think I enjoy this other stuff a lot more than I enjoy doing this ministry thing. And at the, like the first initial thoughts, again, that guilt mm -hmm. just kicks in and starts telling me that like, Oh, well, something's just wrong with you. You just need to get closer yeah. to God. You know, this is clearly, this is clearly Satan tempting you to take you out of ministry because of the potential impact you're going to have for the Lord or whatever. And then there's probably a bunch of people in that world that still think that to this day, that that's exactly that been what been for 20 years, you know? Yeah. And, and, and right. they feel that way about themselves. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, to me, it was, uh, uh, a really long, uh, lonely experience to start working through some of these thoughts in my own head. Cause I was frankly just too afraid to say it to anybody, um, <clears throat> because of how much the stigma is, especially when you go to college there. Like if you go to high school there and then you don't go to college there, there's less of a, of an expectation. But if you go to the college there, it's very much like, you know, I remember <laughs> preachers getting up on stage during like chapel and stuff talking about their friend who had so much potential for the Lord. And now, now he's a used car salesman. And I was like, that well, doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> like he, goes, he still goes to church every Sunday. He's still <laughs> he, like volunteering. He just bought the building. <laughs> yeah. next, you know, outside. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't sound like that's that evil of a thing. And that started to kind of, kind of, uh, uh, wear on me after, after a little while. L let me ask you this because, uh, this is something that I've had a conversation with my with my mom quite a bit because I'll talk about the pressure I felt or the shame that I felt or some of the crazy things I was taught and she'll go like what yeah, you know like totally. what you felt like that yeah and you know and I've realized especially for families that are like new to a church or even just if they're in a different life stage like if they're in big <laughs> I still call it big church, big church adult yeah. adult church and you're in the youth group like they're experiencing a whole different church than you Completely. like different people different leaders different sermons like the sermons are in youth group tend to be the crazier ones um yeah dude when I was in sixth grade elementary school chapel one I won't name him but one of this associate pastors of the church who still is there now uh -huh. who, gets up uh -huh. initials and <laughs> no. and tells us every date is a possible mate i was like 10 years old and they're telling me that if you like do not go on a date with a girl unless you intend to marry her like that's a giant responsibility to throw onto a 10 year old like so, you're just getting ready to come into your high school years where you're just supposed to like yeah. you know have some fun, flirt around, talk to girls and just kind of hang out and be with your friends. But like, I didn't do any of that stuff. I had a girlfriend all the time because in my mind it was like, I should not date this girl. I should not like flirt with this girl, grow out this girl, unless I see a future with her. And I'm thinking that in seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth so grade, did like, your that's parents, ridiculous. Did your parents know like how intense your internal no. monologue was? No, not at all. Not until and not even just dating, but like just even like the pressure of going to ministry. Like, yeah. did they get that? <clears throat> no, not at all. Not until the last couple of years where we really like actually talked you start, about it. They start hearing you talk about it and they're like, what? Yeah. Well, yeah. they just didn't know, yeah. you know? And, and I think, like I said, to my point earlier, if you're a, if 
you're a fully formed adult with a critical thinking brain, you can disseminate information and decide what to accept and what not to accept. But as a kid, you assume just, they thought the same stuff. Yeah. Right? You just yeah. assume that that's what they think is what no all conversation. the authority thinks, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and so, and so they, they didn't really understand a lot of that was going on and, and they still hold to a lot more conservative values mm-hmm. than I do. But, uh, but they at least are at the point now where they're like, man, well, you know, we just didn't realize that that was happening. And it was like, well, how could you have realized that? Yeah. It's not even, it's not even on you at this point. Like <laughs> there's know? just a missing link there. Right. The communication. Right. We just grew, we grew up in this like aquarium where we never left, yeah. you know, my church friends were my school friends, my coaches were my teachers and also my youth pastors and helpers and leaders. Like everything was the same, all from the same people. And, uh, and it was just such an intense way to learn the information growing up that you just assume that like, that's the only thing that's possible in mm-hmm. the world. Yeah. Yeah. So when you realize it's not, and you start making the decisions like, you know, I, I remember you've told me the story of like sitting in like the big hiring career, basically career day for IFB pastors, Ugh. you know, and, and getting interviewed to go to churches, talking to people like that sounds like that really was a formative moment for you and saying like, I can't do this. Oh yeah. It was just a, like looking back now, I wouldn't have said this at the time cause I thought it was like hocus pocus, but it was just riddled with anxiety that whole mm. day. Like you like, thought anxiety was, like, was ho- oh yeah, yeah, I thought anxiety. <laughs> anxiety. Was, <laughs> I thought anxiety was hocus pocus. Like you know, that's healthy. Any any, any form of <laughs> right. You know, mental health y- a problem. Any form of mental health that could be addressed outside of the Bible, I thought was malarkey. You know what I mean? Malarkey, which is, which is a little ridiculous. Right. But anyway, that's a different conversation. So I was there, dude. I just remember this one interview in particular, <laughs> and. Uh, the, the, the youth pastor associate pastor interviews were few and far between. A lot of them were just like Christian schools needed teachers. So I was, which is a whole nother conversation about how terrifying it is. Who gets staffed in Christian schools? Oh yeah. Uh, It's, it's alarming. I always tell my wife, like, um, whatever. I mean, they can't get more mad, but like the school that I grew up in, like now I told her, I was like, it literally feels like the bottom of a drain and like the worst people just kind of filtered in and like they stayed because they won't go down the drain. So they're just like circled around getting also the only people they fungus, you know? And it's like, it's also the only people they can convince to work there for that little amount of money. And it's always a, it's like a youth pastor. It's a brand new college student. They have no other prospects and they won't get trusted with anything else. Here, take our most valued resource, our children. Yeah. You know, anyway. <laughs> exactly. But, but yeah, so sitting in there in the interview. Uh, so yeah, sitting sitting there across from this guy, and he's explaining to me what my job is going to be as this associate pastor of his church. And uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically, it was like, I want you to come in and do everything so that I can preach on Sundays and do nothing, is essentially what the interview was now looking back. Uh, but literally, he goes... He goes, yeah, so we don't have enough work for you to stay busy as an associate pastor during the week. So you'll, you'll be the principal of our school Monday through Friday. And you're how old? And, and, uh, I was 20, 21 at the time. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and he goes, and, and Jackie and I were engaged. So we're interviewing together, you know, nice, nice. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we can't hold hands or hug, but we can interview for a job that moves us across country together at age 20. Anyway. Uh, so we're sitting down there together. He's talking me through, you know, you're gonna be principal mm-hmm. of school five days a week and on the weekends, you know, you're, you're, you know, Saturdays, you're going to be, you know, soul winning and then, um, you know, helping us set everything up for Sunday, Sunday, you basically got to be at church all day for Sunday morning, Sunday night, and you're setting up everything, watching over the, the youth ministry, blah, blah, blah. And, and he, and at the end of it, he just goes, you know, it, it's a lot of work. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a real, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but he was like, but it, but it's really rewarding. And, and, uh, he goes for your salary, it'll be about $16,000 a year. And he's like, and your wife will also have a full-time position for her as a secretary in the church. And we can pay her about $8,000 a year. So com- total combined be about $24,000 a year, which is, which is more than enough, uh, to get by in, in our, in our small town. And like, dude, I, I felt like I was about to throw up on him from how anxious I was. Like I felt like just, God, I, wish I, felt be such a good story. Yeah. <laughs> I felt suffocated by this potential job that was like, absolutely. I'm not doing this, 
but I felt suffocated for whoever took the job. It was just like, you've been a pastor of this 80 person church for like 20 years. It's never grown. Your K through 12 school has like 21 students in it. You want me to be a principal of it and run the whole church so that you can step up on Sunday and just preach and then do nothing the rest of the week, except for like study. (laughs) Like, when you, we know you're not doing that, you're just shoving off responsibilities on somebody else because that's no. what some other person told you is what the role of a pastor should be yeah. and that the pastor should be this God among men and you need to step into that role now and hire somebody to do all of your um, you know, busy work. And it's like, bro, if you can't afford to pay two people more than $24,000 a year, then you cannot afford to hire somebody. Yeah. Like you're not in the position to hire right. a person yet. Like you need to work, bring more people in the church, get more tithe money, and then go hire somebody when you can afford to pay them a wage. This is an acceptable thing to pay somebody for a full-time position yeah. when it's two full-time positions yeah. <laughs> for me and my wife. It was just, it was, it was, it was horrible. So anyway, long story short, we didn't end up obviously taking any of the jobs that we, that we talked about. You're it better interviews. than me. I made, I made $11,000 the first year yeah, of I, I uh, didn't marriage. I didn't yeah, do that. 11,000. I went directly into door to door from there is what happened. So basically what ended up happening was, um, my pastor, uh, who shares my last name, um, uh, that, that was really when everything kind of started going South for me. It was when it was, I was senior year of college. I was about to graduate And I knew that I didn't want to be in ministry anymore. I knew that I wanted to be in business and I uh, didn't know how to articulate that. And I was scared to say it to anybody. First time I brought it up to Jackie, she was upset about it because, you know, she trains, she trained her whole life to be a youth pastor's wife. You know what I mean? So like I'm springing this on her. We're about to get married. And it was like a, oh, freak out moment. You know what I mean? So. I remember telling a couple of my friends um, about it that, that I worked with because they understood my job and my role there and that I was pretty good at it and I was getting this promotion uh, offer. And I told a couple of my friends about it and they're like, oh, well, you know, you, you know, you just, you got to keep your head down and, and, and go into ministry, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I just didn't really talk to anybody because I knew that nobody was going to actually listen to me. So it was months of just like losing sleep over it and I go in to uh, talk about it with my pastor And I'll just never, I'll just never forget him basically just telling me that like, you know, this is just the money talking and sooner or later, you're just gonna have to give that up and you need to go into full-time ministry. And for me, from that point forward, it was just kind of like a, wait, what? Like nobody's like, this is the rest of my life we're talking about here. This is a massive, this is a really big decision. It doesn't seem like anybody wants to listen to me to actually hear Mm-hmm. what I'm thinking or feeling. It just seems like everybody wants to listen to me so that they can tell me what to do. But it doesn't seem like telling me what to do is the thing that's good for me. It seems like that's the thing that's good for them. When and it's I not started good for anybody that's going to be under lose you. Faith. <laughs> you know? Well, exactly. Yeah. And so um, I went out. What ended up happening is I got a job offer from a pastor in Fresno. And he said, we'll take you whatever capacity that you want to work. He was like, well, we, we, you want full-time, we have a full-time job. If you want part-time, we have a part-time job. If yeah. you want to just be a lame in the church, come be a lame in the church. We're just trying to do something a little bit different here. We just want you to come out. And so I took the part-time job at the church just so that I could tell everybody at West Coast that I church. was working in ministry yeah. so that they could mark it off in their little list of placing people into ministry right. and leave me alone about it. Yeah. And, uh, and so I went up there and then that's basically what ended up happening is I talked to the pastor of that church several times and I still give him a lot of credit for helping me with this stuff because he basically sat down for the first time in my life. I heard somebody tell me that like, look, if you don't want to do this, we don't want you to do this. And I was like, oh, wait, really? That's an option. Like that I'd like, God can still be pleased with me and I don't have to like do this thing that I don't want to do that. I don't feel that my strengths are aligned to do. Mm-hmm. Like I don't have to do that, but I can still be like a welcomed here. Like that was just such an interesting perspective to, to have. And so what ended up happening is I worked part-time at the church for like a week and then I was full-time uh, doing, doing what I wanted to do after that. But it, it was just such a weird <laughs> realization where, where he was like, look, it's not a good situation for anybody. If you take a job here that you don't want, yeah. you know, like then you're doing the job poorly because you don't want it. You're taking the job from somebody that really wants to do it and would do it extremely well. Yeah. And you're negatively affecting the people that you're leading or in charge of mm-hmm. because you're not doing a good job and they could have somebody else who would love doing this job. It doesn't work out for anybody. If you just take this out of like duty and to, to me, it just clicked so much with how, cause I'd went on tour like a, a summer or two before we went to like 80 churches and you know, 85 days or whatever. And 
probably 90% of them, at least 80% were just dead churches. And it just dawned on me as to why that was the truth. And it's the truth because the majority of the people shouldn't be in ministry. Yeah. Like you should not be in ministry. You're only doing this because you feel guilted into it or you have no other options for a career mm -hmm. because it makes more sense for you as a human yeah. to get paid $40,000 a year to work on Sundays and Wednesdays and do pretty much nothing during the week except for go to Walmart and find pool noodles for the next youth activity. Like that, you're, you're better suited to do that than go yeah. work an office job for 30K a year. So, hey, I'd rather just do that. So it just like dawned on me as to like why there's so much just chaff in, yeah. in, in the ministry world because so many people shouldn't be doing it, but well, they feel forced into doing it or that's their only option. Again, yeah, you get the bottom of the barrel. Like, and you, that's also why you get this very like juvenile group of people, yeah. you know, that are like perpetual childhood. Like, exactly. oh, it's fun for me to play in youth activities and we'll spend hours and hours setting up for this. And it's like, this is just easy. You know right. what I mean? Like it's, and again, it's a lot of hours and there's a lot and like, it doesn't pay well, but like people default into role. And like, I, I remember, I remember having, well, there's a teacher, more status that comes with that yeah. than being an employee at Walmart. Well, you get to say I'm doing God's work. You right. know, like I, I remember in like, oh, man, I was probably like 17. It's when I was, it's when the bubble for me had burst and I was like trying to figure it out. And, uh, I just called out the episode title and <laughs> the, the show that we're working on. Um, but I remember like two teachers standing up in front of us at different times saying, you think I want to be a teacher? You think I went to college wanting to be a teacher? And like <laughs> as a student where this is the person supposed to imbue like this importance, you know, it's like, and they're saying, you think this is what I want to be doing with my life? Yeah. I remember them telling it a class full of people. And then in the next breath, it's like, why aren't you guys taking this seriously? I'm like, why would I take it seriously? If you yeah. don't take it seriously, like the, you're here because you're, you know, Oh, like you're, you're here because you've got your own easy way that this fell into place for you. Well, that or you're there be, again, so, so much of people's motivations and obviously I'm in the marketing world now, which is literally what I study, but so much of people's motivation is, is a, a step towards status, whatever yeah. status, status can mean a bunch of different things. It could yeah, mean yeah. driving a new Maserati or it could mean driving a minivan because you want to impress the soccer mom friends of yep. yours. Status can be anything. And for a lot of these people, status is having a position at the church, yeah. regardless of what that position is. And that's why I see these people that are like jumping around, they get hired at the church. And then the, the pastor looks at them and goes, you don't have that, you know, leader look, you don't, uh, which was actually told, that's an actual phrase told to me by administration of the college. I didn't have the leader look. Basically all he meant by that was you don't have a comb over, comb over you have a faux hawk. So like, that's not the leader look. You yeah. have to have a leader look and I wouldn't hire you because of anyway. But anyway, so you have all these people that like don't have the leader look or they don't have the potential mm -hmm. or the ambition. So instead of getting moved into associate pastor leadership HB role, the pastor. yeah, they yeah. move you into right. like, okay, why don't you just be the Bible and PE teacher? Because yeah. there's not really much else that we can offer you, but like, what else are you going to do? You know what I mean? Plus you still get to serve the Lord in ministry. Your paycheck still has the name of a church on it. Yeah. So that's more points in heaven for you. You know, it's just like, I just don't understand. I don't understand how this all works. Yeah. And, and like, well, like it just didn't make sense to me at some point. And I always, I call it the crack in the dam because that's, that's the way I always look at it is like my whole life was just fortifying this dam and to put you to this path, exactly. everything it led, it led up to this moment. You know? Right. And then I grew up and became an adult and started experiencing things outside of that bubble that were in direct contradiction mm -hmm. to every single building block of that dam. And so like that first crack happens and a little bit of water starts leaking through. And then that makes it a little bit bigger and then a little bit bigger. And then all of a sudden it's just a flood of water coming through. And, uh, and, and that's what ended up happening when I kind of, when I kind of got out into the real world and started to experience things that were contradictory to the things that I held as Im Im impenetrable belief systems that were completely infallible. And then when I figured out because of direct experience to the contrary that they weren't infallible, it was like, uh, well, what else am I wrong about? Cause if I could have believed that thing that adamantly for that long, that is not, the clear indicator of whether or not I was right. There's other things that inform whether or not I was right. And so that kind of just set me off on this different, you know, journey to trying to figure it out and, and get to the point where, where I could defend my belief systems again. Having everything fall apart, crumble, you know, like that's a jarring situation to be in. Um, I know. 
<laughs> for uh, obvious reasons. Um, shout out to the church split. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should have said that. Uh, but uh, there's going to be an hour response video to that. Um, <clears throat> but no, like when, when everything starts falling apart like that and you start, you know, and, and look, I'm not even just talking about like faith wise, but like even any long held belief system, you know, like when you start realizing like something doesn't add up, even though you logically understand it doesn't add up, everything in you wants it to because yeah. it's easier for it to. Oh, totally. um, so tell me what that process looked like. Obviously, I've already had Jackie on the show. Yeah. She kind of talked about like her experience seeing it, but like for you, how did it feel? Was it just isolating? Like what was the emotion? Yeah. Kind of working through that. Isolating is definitely the word because I, so we, we moved up to Fresno from Lancaster first time out of the bubble, right? Like literally the first time in my life that I lived anywhere, but Lancaster. And one of the and, few ways Fresno would be an upgrade yeah, is exactly. to go from Lancaster to uh, Fresno. <laughs> Quite literally one of the only places I you love could come Fresno from. Fresno has some great food and yeah. some good things. Yeah. All the caveats about Fresno, <laughs> but ultimately it's also, we've all lived there. Armpit know. Of California yeah. Yeah. type place. Yeah. Um, so we moved up there and this is the first time, you know, I, I, I was born in like Riverside area, but by the time I was two or three, I was in Lancaster. All my memories are in Lancaster or Lake LA, which is an even worse version of Lancaster. Um, and so when we moved to Fresno, it was the first time out of the bubble. And, uh, so now I'm away from all the relationships that I grew up with, you know, all of my high school friends, college friends, like those anchors everybody. pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the authority figures, you know, for sure uh, w was a big move. And so now we're kind of in this own place as adults and I'm working quote unquote secularly and having outside influences, you know what I mean? Yeah. That, that, uh, that were in influencing the way that I, that I thought and behaved. And what was interesting about that is that, all of the people that were close to me at that point stopped caring about what was happening to me in my life or, or how my life was progressing just because I was no longer doing the thing that they wanted me to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people like basically everybody in my life at that point was separated into three groups. Number one is like the screw you group where it's just the people who were, <laughs> Just like, I hope you fail. I, I think they found you. my YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> that group, whoever that group <laughs> they is, have found a way of, me. Yeah, they make their <laughs> yeah. way around. Yeah, they find <sighs> the people to terrorize. But anyway, they, uh, you know, this is the group of people that were actually and still actively like talk crap about mm -hmm. me to other people that I know. I've seen actual text message conversations of people talking crap about the way that I decided to live my life. So there's like, there's those people that are like actively rooting against me in every, you know, um, uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Then there's the second group, which is like my actual real friends that are still rooting for me, but they don't really know how to help me. Oh. Right. Cause I'm doing something that's completely different than what any of us know how to do or were raised to do. Yeah. And then the third group is the majority of people, which was, eh, I don't really care. Like you're not doing the thing that we want you to do. Like, you know, good luck. Hope you do well with it, but I'm not going to help you out and try to help you reach your goal. Yeah. Our relationship now, was kind of, yeah, yeah, that was kind of the majority of people was people basically just being like, all right, well, cool, but you're on your own, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, my podcast build your network meant so much to me because when I was saying like, you need to build your network, I was talking to myself. You were starting from scratch. <laughs> like, yeah. Quite literally. And, and what made it even worse is like when we moved to Fresno, I kind of took to a, a, a mentor, the first real mentor that I ever had, <coughs> you know, besides, my, my parents and stuff, but, mm -hmm. um, outside of that, the first woman tour I ever had. And then, and then the same thing happened to me with him. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> after getting really close and building up a great friendship that I thought I, 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 uh, I told him I didn't want to work, you know, knocking doors anymore at the time. And I wanted to do something different. And so I stopped knocking doors and then he literally ignored me. Like I dropped off the face of the planet and stopped talking to me and stopped giving me any time and any, any, any of his time. And, you know, a friendship that I thought I had developed outside mm -hmm. of the world that I grew up in also completely left me by mm -hmm. myself to figure out the next stage again by myself, which is when I jumped into the podcasting world. Cause I was just like, I need, I need some, I need some freaking help here, man. Like I need, I need somebody to step in and like, give me some, some damn direction mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. You know, some damn direction. It's a good callback to the oh, crack yeah. in the dam. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. You're welcome for that. 
So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what, what led me into this crazy, weird, you know, entrepreneurial path that, that I've been on now for the past few years. But yeah, to, to answer your question, it was just, it was, it was very much in isolation because I started kind of moving away further and further from the beliefs that I grew up with and not just like IFB. And so when I was having all those thoughts, I was like, nobody in my life is going to understand any of the things that I'm thinking to myself. So I just kind of kept them inside and hoped that I would forget about it. Like I was gen, I had a genuine hope and desire inside of me that I would just like come back to Jesus and go back to church and forget mm -hmm. about all the thoughts and doubts and questions and things that I, that I had for that period of time. And that's, I think what gave me comfort and not telling anybody about it. I was just like, ah, it'll work itself out, mm -hmm. you know? And I would study and I would read other books about it. And, and like the more I went into it, the more I, I the like the, the fewer answers I had and the more mm -hmm. questions that I had. And, and eventually I was just like, I can't, I can't keep doing this thing where I pretend like this isn't affecting me yeah. anymore. Yeah. So how long was the process from, you know, scaring yourself because of your questioning to coming to, I guess not peace, but I guess like confirming the fact that like, Oh, I'm, this is where I'm at. Like, I just don't believe this anymore. Yeah, it was probably three, three years mm. or so, three, four years. It it, it took like 2014 flipping, to 2017. Yeah. It was a flipping decision. Yeah, I didn't give it any thought or anything. That's always my favorite when people like hear my story and then like send me an article and it's like, oh yeah, this is going to be the thing that changes my mind. Yeah, I wrote that article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You no, know, I, I, that's something I brought up to somebody uh, the other day because they were talking about, you know, relationships and, uh. I was Jackie. <laughs> I was yeah. talking to Jackie the other day. And I was saying, like, you know, it's one of those things where, like, people will, you know, I understand enough to know, like, even when people are reaching out to me with, like, their apologetics or their book or, I'm like, it's on my bookshelf and I've read it and I've given that same argument. You know what I mean? Like, right. and, and not to say, like, there's vi there's people much smarter than me that believe the same thing. So I'm not saying I'm yeah. more intellectual or I'm more intelligent right. now. Right. Um, because I'm, like, I've had people on my show that are, like, professors of medieval history that can give a very good reason for where they're at. But like, for me, it's like, I know I believed what I believed because I studied it and I stopped believing what I believed because I studied it. Right. And I can, I feel very comfortable with both periods of my life because I, I put in the work to study it, which well, is that, more than I can say for a lot of people. And exactly. That's the problem that I had with it. The people that are texting about you in a group chat. Yeah. The people yeah. that text me up in a group chat. And then if I asked them the questions that I had for them, their response would be, go ask this person. Yeah. They would have no idea the answer to the question, well, but they're comfortable. Smith. Exactly. <laughs> they they yeah. want me to go talk to somebody who studied the Bible more than yeah. they have. And then it's just like, okay, well, if that's, if that's the, uh, the, the, the measuring stick, by whether or not I'm going to listen to somebody, then I also have to go listen to people who've studied the Bible and come to a different conclusion. Mm -hmm. If that's the only measurement, right? That's yeah. what I'm saying is like, you can't study yourself into faith. Faith is the belief in something without the ability to prove that thing is true, yeah. which is why, which is why I get fed up with people who are trying to convince me that they're 100% right. And it's just like, it's impossible to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're 100% right mm -hmm. about something. It's impossible to know because it is by definition unknowable. No. That's okay, by the way. Like I have nothing but respect for anybody's belief system uh, or, or the faith that they have. And I, I respect it and, and genuinely wish that I would have just been somebody that had that and kept it because it would have been a whole lot easier on me in my life if yeah. I would have just like stuck to that one thing, you know? Right. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit like pivoting toward the podcast. Cause like, uh, well, and we'll get there in a second, but one thing I do want to talk about, like we kind of hit on the relationship side. So like, obviously for, t I mean, for a couple, it's, you know, and I was talking about this literally this morning on a podcast episode and like circling this topic of family and, you know, um, Dave Ramsey put out a post and it said things you need to know for sure before you get married. And it was like where you stand on finances. I forget what the other four were. And then one of them was, you know, what you believe. And I just thought that's a really shaky foundation because you're not you don't know. Oh, it was what parenting and it was what you believe was one. Of, it was two more of those. Um, and I was just like, if if my marriage to Tara was based on. Uh, first and foremost, what we believe. Yeah. For both of us, things have drastically changed in the last five right. or however many years. 
we've been married. Um, I know the year, but I can't do the math. You know, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so however many years we've been married. And like parenting, like I didn't know Jack about parenting until right. I had kids. And now I know slightly less than Jack about parenting, <laughs> you know. And so it's like I think more importantly, like that doesn't go deep enough. It should be like how do we deal with conflict? How do we work through ideas? How do we have conversations exactly. about difficult things? That's a stronger foundation. It's the commitment to the process, right. not to the result. Because the, 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 if, if, in my opinion, if you're living life the way that you should be living life, you should constantly be changing. Like things, <laughs> like things right. about you should be different than they were a couple of years ago. You should be learning and growing. Right. And, and, exactly. Yeah. And if you're presented with new evidence, you should be willing to alter the way that you believe about something. And that was Not kind if you're of right point. the first time, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was yeah. one of the big, you know, we're talking about cracks in the dam. That was one of the big cracks in the dam for me was starting to realize how often I expected everybody else mm-hmm. to drop everything that they believed and adopt my worldview. Yeah. But as soon as they would turn it around on me, I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm not going to your mosque. No, like, I got it figured out. I'm not going yeah. to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. No, thank hey, you. Which is you probably know? wise not <laughs> to. But, but you know what I mean? Like it just got to the point where I was like, this feels... This feels like the height of hypocrisy mm-hmm. because I'm asking this person open your heart to <laughs> st- yeah. strip away all context and perspective and facts and information that you've received your entire life, throw it up in the air and adopt all of the things that I believe to be yeah. true. But then they want me to do it. And I was like, <laughs> no, thank you. Get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was just like, oh, wait a second. This feels really wrong. It feels deeply wrong that I'm not willing to at least put on their glasses for a second and see the world through their lens and then try to have a conversation that might lead to truth. But the scariest part about it is that we don't want to admit that we could potentially be wrong because everything that we, our entire life right, is built your, on this foundation. And your foundation. eternal life. Yeah, our <laughs> life here yeah. on earth and our eternal life is built on this foundation of, of our belief. So when you're coming at life with that kind of tunnel vision, you've got that hard-headed kind of approach to things and like black and white, you know, here's where we're at, here's what the truth is. You know, coming back into a marriage scenario, your guys' relationship, you both entered marriage with that personality trait to some extent, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, Jackie said like for her, it was more like the rule following. So she didn't really study it a lot for you. You did study it, but we're in the same, you were still a follower, you know, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So when one of you flips that switch, starts asking those questions, starts getting those cracks in the dam, like, how do you navigate that? Like, how are you guys still married? <laughs> is well, the, is uh, the broad, the broad question. It is a good, I question. ask myself every day. Yeah. <laughs> how do we do this? No, we almost, uh, just to be frank, we almost split up, uh, mm. two, no, actually three years ago, three, four years ago. Now, um, we just went through a really, really big rough patch and we, you know, talked about it seriously because, mm. because it was difficult to navigate. It's difficult when, when you, again, you're trained your whole life to think a certain way you yeah. know, where it's like, don't be, unequally yoked together with non-believers you know it's like that's a clear directive in the bible so when i started kind of moving further away from that she wasn't really following me you know at first it was very much like uh like she she didn't so for the first like year year and a half i didn't say anything about anything Mm -hmm. i just kept it all to myself suffered in silence kind of thing right but then afterwards I, i just we started having conversations about it and i would ask a question that she would know the answer to and so her response was like just to start praying for me or her response was to go get me a book that I've already read and have me read it. You know, like her response was not to go learn why because she also didn't know why. And so I think that started to build a little bit over time when it was just kind of like how at first it's met with like a, how dare you even question this. Mm-hmm. But then it's kind of like, a well, I don't really have the answer to that question, mm-hmm. you know, and then that kind of builds on the next thing where Mm. it's oh i don't really have an answer for that question either oh uh that's another one i don't really have a great answer for and i think it start started happening kind of a little bit more for her too and so we had the real conversation of you know is this something that we want to continue you know moving down and it ended up obviously we're still together (laughs) yeah (laughs) to celebrate eight years but well it was not easy I i love you guys but uh, not to make this emotional, <laughs> no. But obviously, I love you guys, and like I think you're a great couple. Uh, but I do have to ask, you know, two two part question. One, why did you decide to stick it out when it would have been easier to say, "We'll just go our different ways." Like we've got different worldviews, like we've got different points of view. 
Um, and then also like what advice would you give to couples where maybe one side is deconstruct or whatever word you want to label it yeah. is questioning and the others not like, how do you work through that? For, for us, I think it was, I think it came down to that. We still both wanted each other and we, we still both wanted a future that was together. And mm -hmm. so our decision was more about what's best for us in five years from now rather than what's best for us tomorrow, because this is going to suck for a little bit. We went to, you know, couples therapy and stuff yeah. and that was not fun. I did not enjoy that. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so it was, it was, it was painful to work through it. Uh, but you know, now we're kind of on the other, on the other side of that in, in some ways, obviously we, should, we are always working on our relationship, but in a lot of ways we're on the other side and a lot of, a lot of the most difficult conversations that we've had to have. And, but like I said, I think at the end of the day, if you have two equally willing parties that you can reach the desired results <coughs> in almost every situation, right. the problem is most of the time, I think that there's one party that's not willing to move or at least have the conversation. And so that's when it ends up, you know, in, in a split. And, and I personally don't think that that's bad. I don't think that you should, I don't think that you, you know, especially if you were married the kind of the way that we were, which was, you know, I, we started dating when I was 16, we got married when I was 21, you know? So like we were just two young kids like yeah. that had, like we got married when I was still in that bubble. Mm -hmm. So like I was committing to somebody for the rest of my life <laughs> without yeah. ever experiencing anything outside of the world that I grew up in. Like that's a dangerous thing to do. So I personally am not under the, um, belief system anymore that like oh divorce is never an option it's like well that's a nice little adage but the fact is it is always an option <laughs> like and if you reach some point where like it makes more sense someone's like honey to, yeah. it's an option <laughs> uh if there if there's a thank god <laughs> no. you know if there's no. one if there's a, but if there is one party that's not willing to do the work yeah. or there's one party that's just like look this is how i'm going to be and this is how i'm going to be yeah. forever then it makes more sense to just go separate ways mm -hmm. and be happy. I know so many people that stuck it out, quote unquote, stuck it out and they're just miserable together. And it's like, okay, I guess you get a point for staying together, but why, yeah. why are you together now? So we, for, for, for us, it was just a matter of like, this is what we want in the future. It might mm -hmm. take us a long time to get to that point, but I think that we're willing to you know fight it sure. out for a little bit. And so my advice for anybody that's in a similar situation <clears throat> is to ask yourself that question. Yeah. Can, it, picture your life in 10 years. Is it, or are you with that person? You're not with that person. Yeah. And if you're with that person, then be willing to listen with the intention of hearing and listening and understanding, not with the intention of convincing them mm -hmm. that they're wrong. Um, and, and just understand that it's going to take time. You know, it's just, it's just a fact. I mean, anything. Mm -hmm. And that's to me, man, that's how anything in life is that, you know, we're obviously starting the new show about figuring it out because that, that to me is just like almost every single thing in my life that's worth having has been difficult to, to achieve or that's how I feel about our friendship yeah. <laughs> and painful and treacherous and horrible. Yeah. yeah. But it'll be worth it someday. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Depends on the show. Yeah, jury's guess. still out. <laughs> no. uh, well, I but, mean, yeah, it's just, that's just a fact, you know, it's yeah. just, that's the yin and yang of life. You know, yeah. the things that are awesome are also not kind of not awesome. You know, well, you, you rip the segue right out from under me. We obviously have a new show called figuring out that's going to be dropping very, very soon. Uh, there's a link in the show notes of this episode for people to sign up so they can get updated when it drops. Um, but for, you know, for one to do the work themselves in trying to figure out some of life's biggest questions, like that's one thing. To create a platform to try to help other people do that is another. So why expand this beyond just your own personal journey to try to help start a conversation with really the world? Like the the, the sky's the limit with how many people could tune in to those yeah. kind of discussions. It, it, it to me felt more like um like a calling again. You know, like all the stuff I do in business to me is like it's just all stuff I want to do and it, it's what I like doing. And I think that it's extremely helpful for people, but this is something that affected me so deeply in my early uh, mm. adult life that I, we, the, the, so frankly, what we were going to do is we were going to create a podcast in a few years when I felt like I had some more, you know, achievements under my belt <clears throat> or I, I could, I could, 
more accurately articulate my beliefs from a position of authority at that point. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of dawned on me a little while back that like, you know what, I'm never going to feel ready. I'm never going to feel like I have all the answers, but that doesn't mean that I, we can't start talking about this stuff yeah. in case somebody out there is going through what I was going through. Cause it sucked. I think a lot of people are, <laughs> you yeah. know, like I think that's, that's what I think you know, when you told me about the idea for the first time um, for the type of show, you know, like to me it was kind of an instant, like, yeah, almost everybody I know that's in our age group, t mid twenties to mid thirties, like they're all doing that. Right. You know, and especially now, cause <clears throat> we are in the information age, yeah. you know, like our parents couldn't question as many things as we can question now and get to some sort of result. Like they literally yeah. had to like go to a library. Well, the questions weren't even presented and see the encyclopedia yeah. Yeah. And Britannica and pull out a volume and turn a bit like now we just ask Siri and we can get to some sort of an actual database conclusion fairly quickly, you know? So I think that, I think that our generation is, is more searching for those types of answers anyway, but also there's a lot of people that were like us that grew up <clears throat> extremely religious like we did, or maybe not as extreme, but still have a ton of baggage that, that mm -hmm. comes from that. And, uh, and, and the reason for me, man, is like, I see people that I grew up with who I view as good people, but when they decided to leave the way that we grew up, there was never a, a secondary readdressing of morals and values. And so I think some of them make decisions that are mm. out of integrity are, and are out of alignment with what even they would probably articulate as a value of theirs, but because they've never actually sat down and done the work to create those values and create a system that you can still live life through without having to worry about Old Testament, New Testament, this person said this, this person said this, and our elder said this, and our pastor said that, without having to like talk about religion all the time, it's still good to sit down and figure out values that <clears throat> values that you don't compromise on yeah. that that are things that help you live a good version of life there are the rules that you have set aside that help right. guide you in and help and help you make good decisions and help you not compromise your integrity because i still think that those things are extremely mm -hmm. important i just don't think that you have to have like a religion that tells you yeah. what they are yeah that moral code is important it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot because i think i think reactionary emotions to the movement we grew up in it for a lot of people um and I, I don't think this is i don't think this has been mine but i see people do it and it's frustrated me for a long time is that people leave and they go into that screw you mentality right of like right you know you can't listen to rock music i'm gonna i'm gonna go to raves you know or you can't well, i'm not saying there's anything wrong with the raves i'm just saying the extreme example like right. you can't listen to this i'm gonna go do this or i'm gonna you, show back up to church <clears throat> wearing a mini skirt and a low cut top right you know? right that was your choice that was mine no yeah. and then uh no you're I got or a lot of you can't drink that. now i'm an alcoholic you can't yeah, do this right. now you're, i'm gonna do drugs or or i'm gonna be they, they know, only become the extreme example right. of what everybody warned them that they right. would become which just to spite them but in reality, like well, you're still under their control. Exactly. Making yeah. decisions for other people in that context is never going to lead to a healthy life anyway. So why are you doing it? Yeah. So, I mean, so there is a lot of people and, and then there's even the versions like, you know, I wasn't allowed to drink or do drugs. So it's like, oh no, I'm a stoner. I'm just going to not do anything with my life. I'll just chill out. Right. You know, it's like, so you get to this really kind of dangerous place and there's not a lot, like you said, there's not a lot out there for people who are you know, trying to figure out what their place is in the world, you know, right. and, and without subscribing to another form of religious or another dogma. toxic one. That's right. That's what I'm saying. Like but, you, you, know. you can't, you can't, that's why, that's why we want to talk about it, man. Like I want to talk about stoic philosophy and mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of these other like great thinkers that have, that have come and gone who, who provide a good system of how to live life, but yeah. without making you subscribe to this religious dogma that is ruling you with guilt. So, so just to kind of pitch the show, we're going to take like two, three minutes and we can kind of close out figuring it out. Like we're going to obviously be having this conversation. So it's me, you, your wife, Jackie, who people heard on the podcast already. Uh, we're going to be sitting down with, I mean, the guest list is pretty crazy at this point. Uh, who all do we have lined up? Uh, so, 
had a quick conversation with Shaq, which was childhood dream of mine. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal. I, the, uh, I don't know who that is. Uh, he's a he. He got famous for playing basketball. A while oh, back. he's a big yeah, fella. Yeah, the Shaq. Yeah, yeah. he's somewhat <laughs> large in stature. I just want um, people to know it's that Shaq. <laughs> it's not. This is yeah. not a bait and switch. Like yeah. we've got Shaq from down the street. You yeah. Know? No. No. Yeah. So so we got to talk with Shaq for a little <clears> bit. <throat> um, Rob Deerdeck was a really great, really That's great conversation. Ridiculousness, bro. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Okay. Sorry. I thought I'd skate right by out. with that one. All right. There's another one. All right. Any more? Nope. We're done? All right. So, Rob, do you I didn't want you to get bored. Okay. Because of the skateboard. All right. <coughs> we're moving. We're moving down. Moving on. Sorry. Rob, do deck, Shaq. So, Rob, do deck, Shaq. We just uh, brought on Elena Cardone this morning. Elena um, Cardone in the house. Talk about uh, relationships and yeah. parenting and stuff like that. Uh, Doug Ellen, that's going to be fun. Um, he's the creator producer of entourage. That was a show on HBO, which no way listen to the show was allowed to ever. (laughs) I literally binge watched the whole thing in 2021 and it stopped in like 2010. All heard of entourage. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but so that'll be cool. Um, uh, I'm working on, uh, working on something with Manny Pacquiao right now. Uh, we, we got, we just got a lot of really, really great people that are coming on, but we're like, our goal really with the show is like never to really provide an answer. Our goal is basically just to provide a frame of reference on how to think about these things. Because yeah. growing up, we were, if you're listening to this show, you're probably in the same boat, which is you were always told what to think growing mm-hmm. up. Like, dude, our college graduation, like, so they read off an entire s- statement of our doctrine or whatever. Mm-hmm. And we had to, they, they said, if you agree, stand up. And so you have to stand up at the end of them reading this, this entire statement of faith, mm-hmm. essentially. And if you don't stand up, you don't graduate. Yeah. You know, there's literally no room for critical thinking or. See how I saw that? Just boom. Just like that. That's why you're here. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> there's no room for critical thinking. Yeah. There's no room for again, how to think they teach you exactly what to think and why you should think it. Mm -hmm. That's it. And 90% of the people that go through miss the why part. They only Mm -hmm. get the what part, you know, they, they miss the why part, but there's never a how there's never a, a how to come to this conclusion on your own type of a thing. There's never a, here's what we're talking about what do you think the conclusion is? Mm -hmm. It's a, this is the exact thing that's correct. Everything else is wrong. And so on the show, it's going to be more like, Hey, let's talk, let's talk to a Baptist pastor. Then let's talk to a Buddhist monk and let's talk to a, an atheist professor. Let's talk to a moral philosopher. You know what I mean? Like, let's just talk to, you know, some, we have somebody coming, uh, coming on the show that grew up in, uh, grew up in a cult has like 50 brothers and sisters and four moms with the same dad. And, um, and grew up in this polygamous cult in Utah, you know, like there's, there's, we just have some really interesting people that are coming on to, to try to talk through and dissect how to become an adult and, and question the things that you were taught in a healthy way Mm -hmm. that leads to good conversation, a creation of your own value system in a way that you can live life that makes sense for you and for your family. Um, without judgment. So yeah. like our, our whole thing is basically like teaching people to question more things, create value from those things and find meaning through the values that they create in their life. Yeah. And, uh, and <clears throat> we're, we're just, we're, like I said, we're not going to try to come at it from a position of we, uh, we know everything and we understand everything because we admittedly don't. Yeah. Our goal is basically just to bring people on to continue the conversation and have a healthy place where people can come in the community for people to come and talk through some of these things yeah. without getting yelled at or shouting angrily at somebody because they hold a different belief than you. It's just kind of like a, you know, cause I miss some of that. I miss the community part of church, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I miss being able to go every week to see people that I like hanging out with. And I, I miss some of those aspects of it. And so we're going to try to bring back a, a little bit of that, but in a, a way that's healthy and not yeah. full of judgmental ales yeah. well again i think it's a show coming out of what we want what we wish existed yeah you know and so um i think it's gonna be really cool and uh i hope people tune in but thanks for doing this uh we yeah. planned on 30 minutes and uh, it's not been I think 30 it's been minutes. A, <laughs> a little bit longer than but, 30 uh, minutes. Yeah. yeah we're uh 
We're going uh, through it, but I think hour, people are going to really appreciate it. Hour nine minutes so, now? Yeah, hour nine. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate it and uh, excited for the show. So if you're watching this episode and you appreciate anything that we talked about, if you like the conversation that we had, you're going to hear a lot more like that over on figuring it out and click a link in the show notes of this episode. Uh, depending on when you're listening to it, the show is either launched or it's about to launch. Uh, so just click there, fill in your information. We'll notify you as, so, as soon as the show drops. You get to hear interviews with people far more interesting than us uh, that are going to help you ask some of life's biggest questions. But for now, uh, this is the Preacher Boys Podcast, and I'll catch you in the next episode.